up and um, they asked me what was going on and I explained and even though it was very hot and bright and they eventually left after about an hour because they wanted to get their kids out of the direct sun but they were snapping pictures like mad and as they said goodbye to me they said uh, this has been the best vacation ever. This is the highlight <laughs> of our trip. Well, actually, we were near the house office building, and people, staff people, came over and talked to us and were, you know, not, not, not elected officials, but staff people of elected officials came over and were glad to see what we were doing and, and supported the effort. Oh, I will never forget. We saw, we were out regularly for the vigil in front of the White House. And people would come and talk to us, and you know there was always a bit of conversation going on. And there were there was a woman attorney and a male attorney that were walking on the sidewalk there by us. In he, no, 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 you no, were no, in no, 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 no. We were just being the vigil. But you were in No, the this vigil. was the plain vanilla vigil. This was the plain vanilla vigil, and. He made a rude remark about the Equal Rights Amendment. They both had briefcases, and she just swung her arm around and hit him on the top of the with a briefcase. And I just, I had to crack. We were just owling. You know, because she didn't make a sound. It was just whack on his head. It was just. And I like that the, the uh, charge the police gave us to her protesting in front of the White House at various times on the sidewalk, chaining ourselves to the fence around the White House or whatever we were doing, was incommoding. Mm -hmm. And my poor mother, who was a Swede, and was in Brazil at the time, and I, I wrote her a note, you know, that we'd been arrested for incommoding, and so on. And she wrote back to me a rather tart note saying, I don't understand why you're smashing toilets in front of the White House for equality. <laughs> There were a lot of interesting reactions. I did a lot of the plain vanilla uh, vigils. And, and just by way of explanation, we started vigiling in 1976. And we um, vigiled every day from the July to Women's to, to Equality Day. Wow. 16 or 18 hours a day or something mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did another vigil in from about 80 to about 82. In there, and that was a Wednesday only. Mm -hmm. Yes, that all vigil. But some of the reactions from the bystanders were just absolutely fascinating. Um, you, you'd see, particularly in '76, couples walking along, and then after they'd gone past us, the woman would turn around and wave quietly while <laughs> the man couldn't see. And the, one of the big differences between '76 and '80, and '81 and '82 was footwear. Water, please. Footwear. In 76, women at lunch went by in their nice middle class shoes. Mm -hmm. And by 1980, you did not see a pair of middle class shoes going by at lunch. It was all sneakers. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's and a middle class shoe? With a pumps. 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 pumps, okay. Pumps, my dear. Um, <laughs> and, and was, it may have been Cheryl Dauphin, it may have been someone else, who was a singer who had been overseas and that was Cheryl. That was Cheryl. And she wrote the song Women Walk More Determined yes. mm -hmm. than they ever have yeah. before. And it really was the di you know the difference in that, that era when women stopped wearing pumps all the time and wore shoes you could walk in when they went out to lunch because you had to walk a long way. And then there were a couple of other ones. Well, that, uh, can I just interrupt yeah. for a second? I was working with the Sexual Assault Task Force and we were interviewing prisoners who were in jail for convictions on rape and sexual assault on women. And I asked them a question that no one else on the committee had ever thought of asking them, which I can't believe, because to me it was so obvious. I said, how do you pick your victims? And one of the first things they all said is they look at their shoes, if they can run or not. If they can't run, yep. that's the first thing that they're interested in as far as attacking them. And the other one was, are they carrying things? In other words, do they have things in their hands so they can't reach out and scratch, scratch them or something? Uh, a, another time on, on the White House sidewalk, a, a whole classroom came by with the nun, leaving this obviously parochial school classroom, and lined them all up to have their picture taken with us. <laughs> and uh, we had 
lot of that. Can, can I have my picture taken holding the banner? <laughs> there, there were many, many people who came and volunteered to hold the ERA. Yeah. Yeah. Many of them tourists from other countries, you know. And it was, it was quite an, and there were a number of women uh, from overseas who said, we didn't know that you don't have equal rights because after World War II, the new German constitution and the, G and the new Japanese constitution guaranteed women equal rights. Well, and not the and third world country has yes, it. Yeah. But they, they were saying, but you don't have this here. You made us do it, and you mm -hmm. don't have equal rights. <laughs> just, yeah, I do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Well, the Canadian women learned when they got their constitution, first constitution in Canada, uh, the women included women in the laundry list of thou shalt not discriminate on the basis of, you know, the, mm -hmm. that whole laundry list. And then they had another whole paragraph just for women. <laughs> he said they wanted to be in two places. Um, uh, another reaction, we were at the White House sidewalk one day, and a woman who was staying at, I want to say it's the Mayflower Hotel. It's across President's Park. And she always stayed there. And she came over to bitterly complain that we had ruined her White House experience oh. with our banners. Oh. And someone else on the sidewalk said, ah, they are the White House experience. <laughs> <laughs> But she she got this special room in the Mayflower every year. Well, by, by and large, the comments of people who were going by were very supportive. Mm -hmm. yeah. A few people did swear at us or make other Washington. Yeah. Washington. Uh, whatever that hotel yeah. is, it's yeah. across yeah. Lafayette Park. Right. And, uh, and I don't it's, remember that. I think it's called Washington. Does it matter? No. For Occidental, or no. I was curious. It probably doesn't matter, but it's now it's going to bug us all night. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so Ray, what did you do in all these years? Yeah. Well, one of the things that I did during the vigil years, I worked at the Ag Department, and the vigil for the White House, um, the permit for the White House vigil uh, was down um, in Park Service headquarters, which were mm -hmm. down in the Haynes Point. So I hopped on my uh, motor scooter during lunch and rode down and uh, picked up the vigil uh, permits. Yeah, because I would go in and negotiate the permit, yeah. and then it would stay with them, and it would take them a couple of days to get it figured out in the beginning, and then Ray would go pick it up, so we'd have it in time to have. But, but we reached the point with the park police where the guy who was the uh, assistant director was the one who was supposed to come in and talk to us rowdy women, and he said, why are we doing one permit for one day? This is nuts. So he said, so then we began to do them by a month at a time. And by the end, we were doing it like for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of amazing. Uh, was this the, the Wednesday vigil? Yes. OK, the once a week vigil yes. in, in the 80s, not the 76 vigil. No, this was, was not the 76 vigil. The this was the one that ended up in yeah. court over mm -hmm. the right to demonstrate. And what else did you do? Well, I think that <coughs> I, I think that um, one aspect of all of this um, uh, reevaluation of society uh, had a profound impact on men. And um, uh, the the instrument of, of now, early now and so on, was consciousness raising. And uh, so eventually, you, um, Fuller, and I, and uh, a couple of other guys had a men's group. He said Hugh, H-U-G-H, mm -hmm. that's my husband. Yeah, and, um, and I think it was very uh, challenging because as a guy, you grow up with a whole set of assumptions and mental shortcuts um, that you don't even question. Um, and so, um, and I think it was a time when, um, uh, when now formed and when, when women were starting to question things, everything was on the table because there were so many things that were wrong. Uh, and so there were so many different avenues uh, that, that, women, that women took on 
And there was also a whole um, philosophical reassessment going on as well and rethinking. And I think that uh, for me, I mean, one of the things was uh, what started out in, in Northern Virginia uh, became, you know, there was uh, ERA now, and then there was a group of women which was really dedicated to radical action um, around the passage of the ERA, which led to the fast in Illinois. Um, and that was uh, kind of a huge and, and scary event, especially because at the end of it, um, Marianne collapsed. And um, it got pretty scary towards the end. And I think that um, And our two daughters were um, very much involved, certainly in, in the vigil, and a lot of the activities were taking place at our house, and, and um, the feminist community was their community. Um, but I think also, I think it became very challenging, especially, especially when the vigil happened. And, uh, I mean, the, uh, the fast uh, in Illinois, um, so I, I think it was it was really very uh, it was very challenging for all of us. But I think I really grew up because I grew up in a family that was really sort of in reaction to the early part of the century uh, in a very uh, sort of unthinking way, and it really made me um, look at myself as as. Uh, as a man and how, you know, how I behaved and how men behaved. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons that uh, consciousness raising was so important to me is because uh, both of us became very active later uh, in the mental health consumer movement. And I realized, and that really was another movement um, to validate and empower people who felt invisible and ashamed um, and powerless. And it's really, uh, it's really about transmitting that understanding of, um, of the power and the potential that each of us have if we choose to act. Ray did a lot. He was always there. I have pictures to prove it. You know, all of, all of the... You know, yeah. we needed something, he got it. He, you know, it, the moral support he gave. Uh, and Ray and I uh, gave a press conference in front of the White House in support of the, of the fast in Springfield, Illinois. There's a, there's a nice picture of the two of us in the paper. Uh, but uh, th there were men that we could always count on. Mm -hmm. there were Mary's husband, Jim, my husband, Hugh, um, our son, Rob. Let's see who else. Emery Hackman, right? Mm -hmm. Money. Yeah. Money. Money. Mm -hmm. Money P. Yeah. But what did other men say to you, Ray? And the other men? Well, I think that were not in your persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think actually I was never really challenged by other men. <laughs> really, uh, and uh, that that's very interesting. I never really thought about that. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know at least at work people didn't. I don't think they, I, I worked in the government and it was a fairly open place. And, um, um, and I think people were pretty progressive and it, it was not a, it, it's not that I paid a personal price with uh, friends or acquaintances mm -hmm. or, or on work, at work really. So I wasn't challenged in that way, but it, it really makes you uh, man or woman take whole other look at what's going on um, in uh, between people it and was see, oh, this isn't so good. And I think one of the things that Ray brought to us <coughs> and did over and over and over again, he for a short time had worked on the Plain Dealer. Pardon? The, the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, <laughs> the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to get the press out. So when 
we did have an action and we were doing something, he was the one who would write the press release, he knew exactly how to do it and who to send it to to get the press out. And it was something that he did behind, just completely behind the scenes. It was just one of those quiet things. And yet, he made sure that there was an audience recording what was happening and why. And it was such an important role. I don't think you've ever bragged about it or talked about it, but you were always there in that sense of mm -hmm. making sure that what we were doing was noticed, was understood, was, and. We need uh, some lessons today. And, uh, <laughs> it, that, and that, I think, was, was a wonderful thing. And Jim was always there. Jim was oh, always absolutely. there. And you, you know, one of the most important things, I think, that the five good guys in Virginia did, because we counted them once and we found five. <laughs> um, and I can't for the life of me remember who the fifth one was. But anyway, um, there was a party at Georgia and Hughes' house one night, and we got talking and talking and talking. And we all suddenly looked around the room, and there were all the women, more or less, sitting in a circle. And the men were all in the second row. Mm -hmm. And somehow to know that these guys, and there were many other little things they did. It was probably Leighton Brown and then Patrick Gaffney. Probably. I'm trying to think who the other the five guys were, because they were two good guys. Um, it was the little things they did that validated us. It said the work we were doing, the things we were doing mattered, and that they were content to sit in the second row and to be support, whereas you know, in, in, in those days, normally you'd have all the guys in the front and the women sitting around or, or cooking or, or doing something, whereas the, the guys were um, maybe not content, they looked content. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, we you know, had two daughters, so, you know, and, we and wanted things it, to it be was, better for it them. It was at least okay, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, uh, and again, the recognition of different people play different roles at different times. They, it, it was a very, it was a time when I know I did not feel safe. I don't mean physically safe, I mean emotionally, I suppose, and, and then we say, with very many guys, and these guys we did. Mm -hmm. You knew they had, they had our backs. Well, my, my husband paid a, a, an interesting price for being very supportive of me and, and the women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, his family, he was, he was one of six children. Um, he, it, he, Absolutely, they stopped talking to him, and they stopped doing anything. When he died, and I notified them that he had died, I didn't get a response from anybody. They just, they were, and I just found that amazing. But, hmm. Did that person terribly married? I don't think he, I don't think he was surprised. Uh, he was a PhD physicist. And uh, had a mind of his own, and you know, often areas of the average person is not going to be able to compute, <laughs> including me. <laughs> but uh, he had one brother uh, who was uh, went to the same school we did, and was a chemist at Dupont, and he was the only family member that had any any uh, connection at all. But he had a brother. Uh, an older, a younger brother, one, one down from him. And I can remember, uh, he viscerally hated me. The younger brother? Yeah, I, I remember one time, I was on the phone with his, uh, one of his sisters, and, and she said to him, the, the brother was visiting her, and Mary's on the phone, and I heard in the background, damn her. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just did not like the concept of what, I was trying to do and what I did, who I was. Now my husband, he was all, you know, he was gung ho, which was all that mattered. I believe he married to his family. I believe the rest of the men, we you you numbered pissant number one and pissant number two. <laughs> <laughs> there were there were several. There were a lot of pissants out there. <laughs> Still are. I remember an Arlington Now meeting, one of the times that I was president. A woman showed up and she said, um, I think, yeah, I have to try to remember the year, probably late 70s. And she said, I'm here in spite of the fact 
that my husband told me he would like to buy me a Cadillac tonight. <laughs>